Yeah, when I started uh, in 1982 uh, with a grant from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to start inventorying fish and wildlife habitat, nature in the Portland, Vancouver metropolitan region, I went to Clackamas County first and was told by their lead planner that there is no place for nature in the city and to go away, basically. And uh, so I went to Salem and, and checked out uh, the reality of the state planning program. And they said, no, 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 you really do need to look at natural resources in the urban environment, go back and get to work. So that's what I did. So basically what I want to talk about tonight are the lessons learned over the last 35 years. I'm not here to bring Portland to, to Hood River. I'm simply hoping that some of the experiences we've had may resonate with you and some of them might even be applicable to your situation here with regard to trying to do a, a better job of integrating the built and natural environment. This is what I read in your comprehensive plan. Open space and natural areas are an integral part of the city of Hood River's livability. And then it says it's difficult. That's an understatement. It's incredibly difficult work. And I've certainly found that out over the last 35 years. This is your plan. Um, I had uh, the great pleasure of going out with a number of local folks this morning to actually do a three hour bicycle tour to take a look at the landscape that you're talking about here. And it was a fabulous experience. That's the route. Uh, Heather um, gave us instructions on where we were going. We saw some really amazing habitat, especially the mixed um, conifer and, and Oregon white oak. The mayor and I are now the best of friends. We had some, we had some really interesting conversations. Um, we didn't agree on everything, but we had a very civil conversation. And I think you've, you're really lucky to have a mayor um, and city council and planning commission and parks director that you do have here. Um, Henry David Thoreau said in Wildness is the Preservation of the World, in 1999 when I started the Urban Green Spaces Institute, I adopted this motto, in livable cities is preservation of the wild. And the, the point being, if we can't create cities that people love and cities that are lovable and livable, forget trying to protect the rural landscape because people will continue to want an acre, five acres, whatever out there in the rural landscape, uh, thereby fragmenting it and there's no way we're gonna protect that. So we need to create cities that are livable, lovable, which means having access to nature and parks and trails and natural areas where people live, work, and play. Uh, you have the same program here that we do, urban growth boundary, only in our case, we have regional, sub-regional, and town centers, and transit, of course, and usually, last but least, ribbons of green. And in fact, we've done a great job. Between 1990 and 2000, um, our region grew by 34% and the consumption of land by only 4%. So we've done a great job of containing um, urban sprawl. However, what about quality of life, biodiversity, and watershed health inside the UGB? Cedar Mills Creek, watershed, 1984, 2002. You're a cutthroat trout, forget it. You're not gonna make it in that watershed. We need to do a better job by, of accommodating growth, accommodating development, and protecting the natural resources. And the problem is, people have tended to think, a lot of planners in particular and others have thought, this is the city, that's nature. You get in your car, you drive to Mount Hood, you drive up the Columbia Gorge, you go to the coast or whatever. That's a very bankrupt system of how the city should work in my opinion. Urban biodiversity is not an oxymoron, which I was told over and over in 1982. Why are you spending resources and time on trying to protect nature in the city? It's absurd. Cities are meant to be built. And in fact, a lot of the groups like the Nature Conservancy and others have uh, contributed to that. I'm not being critical of them, but their philosophy is they're looking at pristine environments, not at the urban environment. And at the wrong scale. Scale is incredibly important. You're talking about 400 and 50 acres, we're talking about 3,000 acres in the metropolitan region. You have to be looking at the right scale. This is a map of Oregon showing all of those fab that fabulous diversity of habitat. Well, they mapped Oregon, Idaho, and Washington at that scale. So if you look at the Portland metropolitan region, it shows up as what? Urban, meaning it's concrete, there's nothing there. Fortunately, I have a friend at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service who contracted with the same people to remap inside the urban growth boundary. Blue is low species diversity. Yellow is high species richness, high species diversity. And once you map at that appropriate scale, all of this yellow pops out. 
um, inside the urban growth boundary. And in fact, just downtown Portland, you've got Ross Island, you've got 160 acre Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge. This is what you see when you go out there. Incredible biodiversity. And even the built environment, 6% of all the peregrine falcon nests in the state nest on the bridges in Portland. The most productive peregrine falcon nest in the state is the Fremont Bridge in Portland. 30, 40,000 boxes of swifts go down a chimney at Chapman Elementary School, two blocks from where I live in northwest Portland. This is a photo I took of 3,000 people, families with their wine, with their beer, with their picnic dinners, watching this spectacle, watching, in fact, a peregrine falcon. There's a peregrine falcon in here. There's also a, PD, a jet coming from PDX. Peregrine falcon screaming through. Sometimes a Cooper's hawk will land on the lip and and grab boxes of Swiss as they're going in. And it, what's really cool about that is uh, this is mid-September, so if you've never seen that phenomenon, go and check it out. There's the raptor people are over here cheering <laughs> the birds of prey. And there are the boxes of Swiss people over here, and they're vying with one another for who they're, they're supporting. Um, this is not just about protecting species. It's about protecting access to nature. A friend of mine, Bob Pyle, some of you may know Robert Michael Pyle wrote a book called The Thunder Tree. In it, he has a, uh, a chapter called The Extinction of Experience. And he posits this incredible question, I think really an existential question. Why should this kid that I took a photograph of at Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge give a damn about the extinction of the condor if he hasn't seen a wren in his own backyard? And that's very much about what we're about. It's not just about biodiversity. It's about providing access to nature, where people live, work, and play. Um, a good friend of mine, Richard Louvre, wrote a book called uh, The Last Child in the Woods and the Nature Principle. And in The Last Child in the Woods, he posited um, a syndrome, nature deficit syndrome, which means that kids who don't have access to nature do not learn as well, they're not as healthy, um, and it swept the nation. There's a huge movement across the country now to ensure kids have access to nature. Sadly, when he was in San, San Diego, this is the quote that one of the fourth graders gave him. I like, I like to play indoors better because that's where all the electrical outlets are. <laughs> so we have a huge challenge here, and that's part of what we're, we're, what we're all about. And that applies as much in... Hood River as it does in Portland or any other city as far as I'm concerned. So what I wanted to do, again, this is not to preach, this is not to say this is what you should do here, but it's lessons learned over the last 35 years which may have some application. Actually, for any project you're working on, frankly, not just land use planning or you know nature in the city. Uh, build on legacies. This fellow, uh, John Charles Olmsted, Son, <coughs> adopted son of Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. designed Central Park, had a huge impact on the park system in the United States. The citizen, not the, not the city, the citizen park board brought him from Boston to Portland and to Seattle and to Spokane and he developed a master plan. Anybody interested in parks, trails and natural areas, I commend their report, 1903 report. You can get it for four bucks from Portland Parks and Recreation. It is an incredibly inspirational um, reading and uh, basically I think everything we're talking about doing today emanates really and, re and reflects the philosophy that Olmsted articulated in 1903. And what he articulated most was an interconnected park system that included natural areas, parkways and boulevards, a comprehensive park system. Power of the outside expert. I met this guy at a conference back east in 1984, brought into Portland five times. He spoke to Portland City Club about the work they're doing, nature conservation in London. Spoke to our city club. <coughs> he didn't say a damn thing differently than I'd been saying and, and my colleagues have been saying for 20 years. But people came up after he finished and s grabbed me by the arm, literally said, we have to do in Portland what they're doing in London. <laughs> Why? He was more than 100 miles away and he had a British accent. So if you really want to get some action, find somebody. And I don't qualify, unfortunately. I'm only 75 miles away or something like that. And I definitely don't have a British accent. So you're going to have to find someone else to come here to have an impact. Anyway, he did have a huge impact. And, and particularly with regard to the work they'd already done, we tried to emulate. They had already done a lot of great jobs. So we just 
tried to do what they were doing. Um, and the example that he used for us, this is um, King's Cross St. Pancras, St. Pancras Station, tube station, in downtown London. You don't get more urban than that, right? This is a wonderful little nature area that they created a wetland, Camley Street Natural Area. Can you find it? There it is, an old garbage dump um, that they took all of the garbage out of and created a wonderful little wetland. And this is low income housing over here. And that became the place that these kids who had no access to nature could go and dip for polywog. If they can do that in downtown London, we sure as hell can do it in Hood River, in Portland. And he had a huge impact on elected officials and others with regard to thinking about not just protecting what we have, but actually doing restoration for degraded areas. And there are good opportunities here I saw today on the, on the bicycle ride to do some um, impressive restoration work. Finding good models. Anybody here from the Bay Area, East Bay Regional Park District, I think is the platinum program in the country. We took elected officials. This is Gladys McCoy, who was chair of Multnomah County Commission. Mike Lindbergh was, was commissioner of parks in Portland. Jim Shalin, a Portland park person took them to show them on the ground what we were talking about. Rather, than, you know, you can wave your arms as much as you want and describe what you're trying to create, but if you can show somebody on the ground example, that helps move, the, move it along. Maps incredibly powerful. Um, uh, the important, I'll, first of all, I'll say the importance of nonprofits working with government agencies. You'll notice that this says BPS Audubon Society, Metro, did not have money in their budget to fly the metropolitan region to create this color infrared photography. So I, on a handshake with a Metro staffer, put up 20,000 bucks to pay Bergman Photographic Services to fly the entire Vancouver, Clark County region and Portland region with color infrared photography. A very poorly paid graduate student, Paul Newman, digitized all that and created for the first time in our region a map that showed all the remaining natural areas. Um, we could not have done that had it not been for a nonprofit working with a government agency because they didn't have a budget, they couldn't legally enter into contract, and that made all the difference because Metro said, we're gonna, we're gonna have to wait a year. Well, you know damn well, if you, you build momentum on some kind of an effort and you're saying, we're, we're gonna sit around for another year, uh, it's dead in the water. So that kept the project going. So. Uh, Nonprofit government um, partnerships are incredibly important. Using the media, a uh, good friend of mine who went to grad school with, Mike Utah, told me never to be afraid to ask somebody to help you out no matter how important or famous they may be. This is Tony Hiss. I read a piece he wrote in the New Yorker magazine called The, the Experience of Place. Amazing, he turned it into a book. So I figured, what the hell, I'll call him up. Called the New Yorker, he answered the phone. <laughs> Tony here, I said, Tony Hiss? Yeah, this is Tony Hiss. Uh, we're doing some cool stuff in Portland, you should come write about us. <laughs> he persuaded House and Garden, House and Garden, I think it was, magazine, to come to Portland and write about what we're doing. And they paid him to do it, and here he is in the Oregonian, may sound um, uh, what, well, may not sound like a big deal, but the fact of the matter is civic leaders, elected officials, other folks really love it when somebody comes from New York City and writes about what the hell we're doing in, in Portland, Oregon. And the cool thing was, there's our map. So we produced the map and not long after, there it is in a national publication taking on a, a reality. Um, so using the media is incredibly important. Icons are powerful. This is Bud Clark, our former mayor. He gave a talk downtown Portland, mentioned Great Blue Herons numerous times. Um, I grabbed him on the, on the way out of the Hilton Hotel, said, Bud, we need a city bird. It should be the Great Blue Heron. He said, whoop, whoop. Everybody remember Bud? <laughs> Two weeks later, we had a proclamation establishing a Great Blue Heron as Portland city bird. So what? That sounds trivial, maybe, but the fact of the matter is every year, every year since 1986, in May, June, we go to city council, work with staff, with the mayor's staff, write a new proclamation for that next year, articulating what we're gonna do over the next year to make sure herons are gonna continue to cohabit the city of Portland with us. So it's an opportunity for us to re-up politically with the elected officials. And this is crucial. 
And you guys have a plethora of opportunities for this kind of activity here. I happened to be at Bridgeport Brew Pub that afternoon. The brewmaster, Carl Okert, came up. How are things doing out of bond? I said, great, we just got the Great Blue Heron Adopted City Bird. I just brewed an ale I haven't named yet. Let's call it Blue Heron Ale. And that also may sound trivial, but the fact of the matter is that became the place where the mayor of Oregon City, the director of Metro's Green Spaces, natural resource manager for Portland Parks, wetland ecologist for EPA, would gather on a regular basis over pints of Blue Heron Ale, get to know one another, and build those relationships. And I'm suggesting you need a city bird here. I don't, maybe you already have one. So I don't know if it should be a Lucis woodpecker. Or we saw lots of uh, purple martins today, so I think I'd be a good candidate. Uh, creating your own reality. This is the area I got involved in 19, 47 years ago when I was a grad student. Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge. The city wanted to fill it. They wanted to put soccer fields, baseball fields, children's museum, et cetera, et cetera, in this huge 160-acre wetland. So a friend and I took these signs with a pint of, uh, or a, uh, I'm not sure what the size was of Jim Beam, um, <laughs> and posted these signs all around Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge. And within a few days, the Oregonian, well, a couple weeks, was writing about Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge. Four years later, city council adopted the o Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge management plan that we wrote up. So it's, you know, sometimes you, know, you take different techniques, uh, to maybe some guerrilla techniques to get this kind of work done. It's all about relationships. As I said, this is a group of people, a very minor subset of the people who have been working on these issues forever. And the important point I wanted to make is over those blue heron ales, people came to get to know one another, and then they got to get to trust one another. And we have a very, I don't know, I get the sense that there's a similar dynamic here. I could be at Metro or City of Portland kicking somebody's butt on Monday you know, an elected official, a city staffer, whatever, Tuesday, we're drinking blue hair and ale together, talking about how to advance a project that they care about. So it's very important to have that relationship. It's not, you know, us against them. It's very much a collaborative effort. And the only way to do that is really to conscientiously, intentionally spend time building those relationships. And that, as far as I'm concerned, we would have achieved nothing in our region without having uh, expended that kind of energy. Um, connecting people landscape, uh, as with this morning, there's nothing to substitute for getting people out to see, get to love, and advocate for these areas. Coalitions are incredibly important. The first one, this woman started the 40 mile loop land trust, uh, Barbara Walker, who unfortunately died a few years ago, and showed me their concept, which emanated from Olmsted's 1903 plan, his parkways and boulevards. It's 160 mile bicycle pedestrian circle around the region. Um, that connects all of these parks and, and from my perspective, more importantly, the natural areas. So I thought, whoa, wait a minute. We have trail advocates getting together with natural resource advocates. That's a very powerful coalition. Um, and in fact, you've got the parks and open space framework, bicycle pedestrian framework. Putting those together, I think, is really crucial to achieving what you want to here, trying to connect people to those important parks and natural areas. Uh, we started the Coalition for a Livable Future in 1992, brought the Urban League of Portland, Albana Ministerial Alliance, um, the Community Development Network, the Affordable Housing Advocates, along with Thousand Friends of Oregon and the Greenies to come together to start collaborating to try to figure out how do we take our issues and integrate them. And in fact, I love this photo. This is Sam Chase. He was director of the Community Development, Community Development Network, the Affordable Housing Advocates. This is Sue Marshall, the director of the Tualatin River Keepers, a houser, a greener. Together, testifying before Metro Council, urging them to pass a bond measure to acquire natural areas, a houser and a greener. He is now a, a Metro Councilor. We've had a very interesting pipeline through the political process. He's now in a position to work on both those issues, incredibly important. I was going through your report. These are two of the word clouds that your consultants produce for you. Parks, see how big parks is? I think there's, there's housing over there. And here, there's housing. Housing, oh, there's housing, it's huge. Oh, I think, oh, there's parks over here, really small. The point is, 
that both of these are incredibly important. And this is a quote from Ra Rahm Emanuel from a, a very uh, brief period of time ago. Housing alone doesn't make a neighborhood. You need housing with parks, and there's no reason, in my opinion, why you can't do both. Housing and habitat, this is a shot that I took from today. And I know there's a site that the city owned that's been rezoned for housing. It's a fabulous oak forest. There's no reason why those two can't um, coexist. Um, lessons learned, share the information. This is a book that we produced in 2000. We have a new one in 2011, Wild in the City, a guide to the natural areas in the city. And this is really cool. Some of you may want to come next year. In February, every year, we have a, a urban urban ecology and conservation symposium. We, we started a group called the Urban um, Conservation uh, Coalition, no, no, Urban Ecological Research Consortium 15 years ago. And we bring like 500 people to Portland State University to share their research on ur urban ecosystem. It's, it's a fabulous experience. We give people eight minutes. Um, if they don't finish in eight minutes, we have a duck, we quack them off. Um, and they get a lot of information out of it, and they, they share information with one another. So getting that information out there is important. The results, so we've done all this work, so what? Well, I went and spoke with Mark Hatfield. How many people remember Senator Mark Hatfield? Then chair the appropriations, talk about a bygone era, a Republican senator. Talk to him about getting money to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that would go through U.S. Fish and Wildlife to Metro. He came up with $3 million to kickstart the Metropolitan Green Spaces program in the Metropolitan Region. Very supportive of land use planning, um, an amazing guy, to say the least. Um, and this is what we developed. Uh, of course, those of you who work on committees, this took six months to get people to agree to all those words. We wanted to create a cooperative regional system of natural areas, open space, trails, and greenways for wildlife, and very importantly, for people. And in fact, this is incredible. So in 1988, I'd given up on the last land use planning program. I had I tried as hard as I could going through goal five, all the planning stuff, we were getting no protection, went to Metro and said, you guys are the regional government, you should be doing natural resource planning at the regional scale. They agreed, amazing, this is 88. By 92, they adopted a Metropolitan Green Spaces Master Plan for the Portland and Vancouver Metropolitan Region. Pretty quick work. We passed two bond measures for 363 million bucks. They now own 17,000 acres of natural areas throughout the Portland metropolitan region. That is very fast action. And in fact, what we're talking about is, is incorporating or protecting and restoring all that stuff inside the urban growth boundary, but also with the rural landscape. So I guess I would just admonish you to think about, you've got 450 acres you're talking about tonight, how does that fit into the broader regional context? And I think, you know, Burnham said, make no little plans. I think in order to get people really excited, you don't need to start really thinking regionally. And obviously, we're talking about connecting our regional trail network to Hood River along the Columbia Gorge, so there are all kinds of great opportunities. Um, and this system that we're talking about creating drives the re economy and tourism, provides access to nature, creates public places to bring people together. This is a, by the way, a, uh, an osprey that came into the Pearl District in Northwest Portland to Tanner Springs Park, where there's a minute little open body of water and some little wetlands that Herbert Dreisaitl from Germany designed. Some woman threw carp in there. I was driving by shortly after they uh, uh, dedicated it, and this osprey flew across my windshield in front of my windshield, fortunately, into that pond and got a koi. Went up to this building <laughs> and ate it, and then crapped all over the window of the, con <laughs> the condos. Um, obviously, it creates some property values. This is huge. Kaiser Permanente actually endorsed the 2006 bond measure. They've never endorsed anything ever in the history of Kaiser. The reason they did, I talked to their VP in, in Oakland, they see the nexus between human health human psychological and physical health and access to nature, access to parks, and of course, recreational opportunities. So they're very actively engaged with us. And a good friend of mine, um, a really good friend whose name, Tim Bailey, wrote a book called Biophilic Cities. Those of you know E.O. Olson posited that 
that biophilia or our affinity to nature is hardwired. It's a genetic thing for us. We love nature as human beings. And he proposed a really cool analogy, I thought. You know, the f you all know the food pyramid, right? You do not eat steak every day, right? You want grains and, and all those good things you're supposed to eat day to day. Maybe you go after steak periodically. Well, he, po he is positing and poses the question, what's the minimum daily requirement of nature? You're not going to go to the Arctic once a year, probably, maybe, maybe never, but certainly not frequently. But when you walk outside and you see that oak forest outside your house, that's the grains, that's the, the good fruit, that's all the good stuff that you get. And I think the daily requirement of nature is every day from the time you walk out of your house, you have access to nature. Um, valuing uh, nature, ecosystem services. One of the things we need to do is, is consider all, all the, uh, the, the natural resources as part of the green infrastructure. Both the natural areas like 2,000 acres, Smith and Bybee Lakes, and even these bioswales um, in northeast Portland. And in your comp plan, it calls for you to include natural features and open space in the design of public utilities. So your stormwater managers are just Im as important as your park managers. They need to figure out how to utilize um, those sources of revenue together to integrate them to do uh, uh, a better job of protecting and restoring natural areas in the urban environment. And in fact, the City of Portland Bureau of Environmental Services, this is before, this is after, they use FEMA money FEMA flood insurance money to buy 50, 60, 70 houses, moved them out of the floodplain, people relocated. This is what it looks like after. An amazing project that increased flood capacity, improved the environment, and of course, access to nature nearby. And in fact, they did another study. They said, if we just went in one area and all we did was replace all of the aging pipes, it would have cost $144 million versus $81 million if they combine it with planting trees, bioswales, green infrastructure. So it saves money as well as, as providing multiple benefits. So our system connects uh, the region um, with trails and greenways. And of course, today, I took this photo. Here you've got the Columbia River Gorge, which connects up with us, what we're doing in the metropolitan region. It's no secret, by the way, no accident, that this is about 1992. Is that right? Yeah, 1992. This is when Metro adopted the, the Green Spaces Master Plan. Once you have a plan in place and you can point to exactly what you're going to do, voters will approve bond measures. That $363 million bucks was passed by over 63% of the voters in Mul not just Multnomah County, but Cl Clackistan, Clackamas County, and Washington County. So that's, that's, I should go back and point out, that is the accretion, the addition of public natural areas over that period of time. Uh, no place for nature in the city. That's what I was told in 1982. This is David Bragdon before he went to work for Michael Bloomberg in New York City. He was president of the Metro Council. He announced that in his last two years in office, his objective was to create the best park system in the world. That is a pretty huge shift in philosophy among elected officials. And what resulted from some meetings that we held and a bunch of focus groups was the concept of the intertwine, which is the system of parks, trails, and natural areas, and the intertwine alliance. The first thing we did was uh, create a bi-state Portland, uh, Vancouver, Metropolitan uh, trail system and a regional conservation strategy and biodiversity guide. And in fact, we're looking at the entire 3,000 acre um, uh, geography, which includes the rural and the urban environment, to figure out and mapping it so we can see what's out there in the rural environment and what is inside the urban growth boundary down to the neighborhood. So again, scale is incredibly important. So when you have this kind of scale, you can start thinking about, oh, if you're going to increase the urban forest canopy, where might you start and create connectivity? This is uh, the website for the Intertwine Alliance, the intertwine.org. And I finished with eight minutes to spare, and we're going to have Q&A, I think. <laughs> so 
questions, I take rebuttals. <laughs> I'm okay. Well, Mike, thanks for the talk. I enjoyed it uh, very much. And I'm still formulating my question, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've kind of heard versions of this. So I, I've heard from people that one thing we lack in Hood River is, is park space in terms of ball fields and, and areas like that. And right. I feel like, I guess I can see where they're coming from because I feel like nature is a lot more accessible here in Hood River in terms of you know distance to right. natural areas than it is in Portland. And so maybe they have a point and uh, how do you balance that with protecting nature, natural areas, I guess? Uh, well, that's my question. yeah. That, that's, that's a big deal in Portland as well. I'm trying to shut this damn thing down. Um, well, right, we need both. Um, and w the reason that we started the program at Metro was at that point in time, Portland Park, believe it or not, and Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District were all about ball fields, about active recreation. So I said, well, screw it. I'll go to Metro and we'll get them to take on the natural areas. Well, that program became so popular that the local park providers started thinking, wait a minute, this is obviously a winner here. People love Metro by virtue of creating that, that green spaces program. And over time, politics changed, um, priorities changed, and City of Portland and Tualatin Hills Park and Recre Recreation said, wait a minute, no, we need to allocate more resources to naturalists. That doesn't mean you give up on the, on the ball fields. And in fact, what we did um, similar to East Bay Regional Park District, or actually identical, was when we passed the bond measures, we said, okay, Metro gets 75% for strictly for natural areas, the local park provider, providers get 25% to use for their own priorities. So they can use it for natural area acquisition or for addressing park deficiencies in East County. So you need both. And as I said, I mean, you can, this is a philosophical debate you can have, I suppose, but you don't, I don't think people should have to get in their car and drive somewhere to get to nature over on Mount Hood or, or whatever. They should be, have it outside their, their front door uh, near their school where they work, live and play. So you need both. It's not an either or uh, conversation and that's what we're trying to do through the Intertwine, the Intertwine Alliance to say create a system of <laughs> parks, trails and natural areas that serve people equitably throughout the, in our case, the region and here it'd be throughout the city. It's not an either or. How do you get developers to adhere to the grand plan? I mean, what, what is it that you have to do to make that happen? Well, it depends on how progressive they are. Interesting thing, that aerial flight that we did, the color infrared photography, we had to pay Bergman Photographic 20 grand to do that flight. They from the, the next year, they started doing it themselves on spec. You know why? The development community were buying those photographs. They were buying that information because they wanted to buy land near these areas because they knew it would enhance the value of their property. So there are some progressive developers who get that and will contribute to the bond measure, which they did um, to a very large extent. So it's, you know, it's a matter of education. It's a matter of getting uh, that information out that they're going to benefit. Um, and obviously there, are, there still will be conflicts over particular pieces of land. You can't get away from that inside the urban area. And I'm not saying you protect every square inch of natural areas, but you certainly need an integrated system uh, that works as a system. So it's, yeah, you got to, put the work in to work with them. Hi, Mike. Um, thanks for coming here. Yeah. And um, so you talk about s the importance of scale. Yeah. Which I, I could really relate to. I thought, oh yeah, that's good. Um, so what, you know, and you talk about a regional plan. What should Hood River look at for, I, I'm kind of fuzzy on what, would a regional plan be for Hood River? Well, that's up to you to, des to decide. In our case, we actually went about it in a scientific way with regard to watersheds. We, we, we did the whole thing based on watersheds and we went to Huck 4, I think they call it, right? 
watersheds are nested inside one another. And we decided that there was a huge amount of work um, south in the Willamette Valley, and there was a huge amount of work with regard to biodiversity in the Puget Trough. There's a huge amount of work in the federally owned Forest Service lands to the east, and a lot of work in the um, state lands to the west. So we decided to pick an area that was unique that would complement all of that other work going on out there. So you would need to look at efforts that are going on around Hood River and try to figure out how can you do something that would complement th that, that other work. I don't know um, what that is, but that's the best way to approach it, I think. And you need to pick a geography that people care about um, and are willing to step up and do some thinking and planning around. Not to get you off of your 450 acres, but right. Are we really to do that, to really do a plan? Um, have we looked at, at it in a bigger scale? I guess that's what I'm trying to say. That's a rhetorical question. I'll take that as a Thank rhetorical you. question. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Thanks. <laughs> I guess maybe a little bit similar to Patty's question, but in terms of protecting natural resources, how much of it has to be outright, if you want to say public purchase, and what are some of the other options, whether you're talking about, you know, less than fee simple or through zoning development uh, provisions, what are the options? Incentives, all, all the above. I mean, there is no, my time's up. <laughs> um, yeah. Stop. Usually, it, usually it's a duck. <laughs> Cancel. There we go. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan, some people aren't, of regulation. The, the goal five, the uh, goal five, six, seven, you've got water quality, um, hazard lands, um, fish and wildlife habitat, wetlands, et cetera. There is some, some of that land should be regulated, that they're not, it's not allowed to be developed. And we've done that. Actually, as I said, I gave up in 88, but went back to Metro later, and we got Metro to adopt um, Title III, which included water quality and, and floodplain management, which all the, you know, Metro is a unique beast. Metro is the only directly elected regional government in the country, and by law, all 23 cities and three counties have to amend their comprehensive plan to conform to the regional plan. It took me a while to figure that out, but we got a regional protection for uh, uh, water quality and floodplain management that all the local jurisdictions had to implement. Was it perfect? No. Um, then we went back later and created what's called Title 13, which is Fish and Wildlife Habitat, Goal 5. This is like 30 years after we tried it. Uh, Metro adopted that, only, unfortunately, only for riparian areas, not for upland habitat. But at least, you know, we got some additional protection for stream corridors, which are incredibly important. So the regulatory programs, I think, hugely important. Acquisition, if you want to protect it, you got to buy it in some cases. So passing the bond measures. Um, incentives, we, we increased, I sat on a committee, uh, and by the way, uh, I met a fellow named Brock Evans. Anybody here know Brock Evans? In 1982, when I started, they had just created the North Cascades Wilderness Area. And I just started as urban naturalist. And I said, how the hell do you do something like that? It's massive. He didn't hesitate for a second. If you know Brock, he did not hesitate for a second. He said, endless pressure, endlessly applied. I used that for many years, and I, I, I attributed it to him. And after about 30 years or so, I said, you know, damn it, this is, this is mine. <laughs> so I literally, I called Brock up, and I said, Brock, I am appropriating your line. He said, go for it. It's yours. <laughs> so the point being that all of this was like over 35 years. It do, this stuff doesn't happen overnight. So keeping at it, of course, is incredibly important. So I was talking about regulations, talking about the bond measures. Oh, yeah, South Waterfront, huge new development on the waterfront um, in downtown Portland, right, near OHSU. 
we spent five years haggling over the width of the greenway. We finally got 100 feet. The city of Portland only had a 25 foot setback, believe it or not, to this day. Uh, we got 100 feet. And the way we did that was we said, Homer Williams and the rest of you developers, you can go up another 80 feet or whatever. They got additional height. So incentives can have a huge, hugely important um, impact. Um, there are all kinds of other things. People talk about transfer development rights. I've not seen an example where that's really worked, um, but it may in your case. Um, obviously, <laughs> obviously donations are great. Um, we talked about that a little bit today. There are some local people who may be in a position to, to, to give the park district or whoever land. By the way, I want to I want to say that you guys are really fortunate. You've got a large park district here that we would love to have in the Portland metropolitan region. We keep talking about how do we go about creating a new larger park district that has its own damn source of funding and you're not going after the general fund at the city, which is, uh, it's brutal. Because of course you're talking about housing. Are you gonna fund housing? You're gonna take care of the homeless? You're gonna build a park? You know, those are brutal conversations. So if you can have a park district with its own designated um, funding source, that's golden. So that did not answer your question entirely. It's, it's like a huge toolbox and we've got to use it all. But acquisition, regulation, incentives are the, the primary ones that I'm personally familiar with. You got one over here and one here. Lessons learned could you give us about invasive species as you try to develop a natural area that's disturbed? Well, you know, invasive species has become a really hot political, ta uh, political potato for a lot of folks. There are those who argue, why, why are you sp putting all that energy into invasive species? And then there's a whole other larger ecological contingent that says, no, we, need to, we really need to get a handle on it. In fact, the Bureau of Environmental Services for the city of Portland has a reveg team. That's a, a group of professionals that go out there and they go at it. And with Oaks Bottom, they've removed all of the Himalayan blackberry, well, all Himalayan blackberry, and they're using herbicides. People don't like that, but the fact of the matter is you are not going to get rid of invasive species without some use of herbicides um, and replanting with native vegetation. Um, they've achieved a huge amount of great ecological restoration and stream restoration in Johnson Creek along the Columbia Slough. So it's, a, it's an ongoing, very expensive, very intensive effort, but they're, they're putting money, they're putting resources into it. So I think it's important is my, my response. Oh, sorry, I, I shouldn't have done that. I stepped out of my role, shout it out. That is, yeah, that's a huge challenge. By the way, I, I'm on the Planning Sustainability Commission. Every time the, the staff says we're trying to create more density, I say don't say that. <laughs> Seriously, we are not trying to create, that's not the goal. The goal is sustainable, livable communities. That is not the goal. That's like the urban growth boundary. People, the urban growth boundary is sacrosanct. It isn't. The urban growth boundary is a tool. It's not the end, right? It's a very important tool, but to say, which I was told, and I've got friends, a thousand friends of Oregon and elsewhere that we have arguments about this. Oh, you can't protect nature in the city because then we'd have to expand the urban growth boundary. So what? If you're protecting stream corridors and habitat and that results in a need to expand the UGB adjusted, that's fine. That's a good regional goal as far as I'm concerned. That's not to say we should willy-nilly expand the UGB, but it's a dynamic that we need to think about, it's a tool. Um, density, 
people who, who say we're trying to create more density, we're trying to create a livable city that includes um, <laughs> higher density development um, along transit corridors. And what we're trying to do, and that's the big challenge, so we protect the big, we have Forest Park, we have Oaks Bottom, that's relatively easy compared to the interstices where the buildings are. So one of the things we're working very hard on is increasing green infrastructure that goes into the bioswales, that goes into ecoroos, that goes into creating green along with those developments. And we're working, you know, it's, it's hard work, but we're, I think we're making a lot of progress along those lines. And I'll, I'll, I'll make one more comment. One of the things that we did that pisses the neighborhoods off big time, frankly, we had a guy stand up screaming at us on the commission is trying to um, create more um, housing, the middle, more housing for the middle, ADUs, um, smaller um, units that people can actually afford. And I know that's, pro I'm sure that's an issue here as well. And it's a hot political potato, but we need to do a better job of creating more housing types. Uh, my sweetie over here is director of the Portland Housing Center. She's doing an ADU and she ran into some real hurdles through the, through the permit process. We have to do more of that too. And I'm sure you need to do that in Hood River as well. So it's not about density. It's about creating great cities and great neighborhoods. Are you referring to the accessory? Uh, accessory dwelling unit. So you've got, uh, in her case, a small place that used to be her garage that she can, she can age in place. She's not that old now, but <laughs> eventually she could move into it maybe and rent her house or whatever. Yeah. How many people have I pissed off saying that? <laughs> I, I have to say that your tenacity and diligence is extremely inspiring. I cannot believe what you've accomplished. Uh, we all. <laughs> Thanks. With Hood River, you have open green space from any, any which point within four linear miles. There's, you, you can get it into the mountains. It doesn't matter. Right. You don't. Not to say that parks aren't welcome. Parks are great, but people can people can get to parks or any sort of open green space. Within how many quickly. miles you said? Four linear miles. Yeah. Okay. At, at the at the bare minimum. Yeah. Um, from any point in Hood River, yep. so you can get into it in that in that point. And I think your impetus is on parks and how much they really uh, help urban sprawls. And I think that it's a valiant effort. And I think it's it's amazing. So coming into Hood River when there's so much of it. Uh, the abundance is amazing. Outside. Right, outside of it. So how do we convince or change the mindset, maybe, which is hard, and maybe another rhetorical question, of the people within the community to think that, okay, we need a little bit more density, that dirty word, and we need a little bit more ability to find affordable, another maybe dirty word or desired word, depending on what standpoint you are at, Yeah. inside of the community. Because we have so much amazing things just within four miles of our reach. Why can't we have a little bit more density in there? How do you, or how do you as a parks representative, sit and change people's mindset to say that, you know what, there's so much beauty here, why not let more people in? Or even if we don't want to let more people in, how do we make the people that we have here now work better? Because all of us know that wine country in Cascade Ave sucks. You can't you can't get through that. We know that. What's we that? know that uh, it's it's just an intersection. Oh. There's intersections that are horrible. There's yeah. uh, downtown. It's it, it makes things tough. So we all know that our infrastructure is horrible, and that needs to be figured out. Period. Yep. And that's that's maybe the elephant in the room, but. How do we change the mindset for Hood River as a whole, saying that, hey, you know what? You guys have an amazing place, and there's more people that want to move here. How do we make it better for everybody in, in the fact that it's, it's imminent? It's going to happen. How do we figure that out, and how do we help that, even within parks? And how do we make it, how do we make it feel good for all the people that are here in a nature's perspective? Well, everything you just described exists in Portland. You can't drive. I, if somebody wants me to meet them on the east side of the river now at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock, I say, no, <laughs> I, won't, I won't do it. It's insane. Um, affordable housing, you know, the housing issue, homeless issue, all of those 
things exist in the city of Portland as well. And we also, I mean, that's the beauty of having the urban growth boundary. We can be out at Sabi Island in 20 minutes. We can be out in the farmland in Washington County in 20 minutes, depending on the time of day you drive. Um, and that argument, the same argument was made to Olmstead back in 1903, as a matter of fact. I don't know how many of you know Portland, but they, they asked the question, uh, why, should, why should the city acquire Mount Tabor for near Swan Island that is so far removed from the population? Is it, why should we be spending money um, because people don't really live there well? Duh. So I think people want, again, my, my experience says people want access to nature near where they live, that it isn't enough to have it four linear miles away, for their kids in particular. So you talk about safe routes to schools, I think about safe routes to nature. Um, both are important, so there are no damn easy answers. I don't have the silver bullet. Uh, your, your comment about persistence is what makes the difference over time, and I think people care about what their landscape, their immediate um, radius of reach without getting in a car necessarily. You moved to or from Portland? From Portland to, to here. Right. Yeah. Well, think about, I just turned 70, right? There are a lot of older folks who either can't for physical reasons or they don't want to, they can't drive a car maybe or whatever. Um, and the, you know, both, both ends of the spectrum, the, the young and the old, having access to these areas without, again, having to go their four linear miles. Maybe four linear miles for them is like unacceptable. And, and unfortunately, when I was a kid, I'd get on the bike, I'm gone. That, does, that is not acceptable anymore for most parents. That you just don't have free ranging kids, or if you do, you get in trouble. We got to just shout it out. You do what? Yeah, a consultant. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're it. But you live here. You got to move to Seattle or something. I don't know. Can you guys actually hear him? Okay, just do the mic. He hunts ducks. They used to hunt ducks. He's a beaver. He's supposed to be helping me. Um, so I live on the west side of town. I um, have done for 15 years. Um, and from, from experiencing issues with my own house, um, discovered that people used to hunt ducks on that whole west side area of town. So the piece that I'm interested in, and, and, and I'm thinking we can probably weave some threads together here, is there's some natural resource issues out there in terms of wetlands, wetlands that people don't know about. There is Henderson Creek. There are, um, I think, a particular of interest to me, there's a lot of clay soils from old Mount Hood activity that at this time of year, you, had, you would have no idea that they're right. there. Right. Come November when the rain turns on, yep. they swell, the water pop, pops back to the surface, and all of a sudden you see all this hydrology that you're not seeing the rest of the year. Right. From your experiences in Portland, um, you know, 
buying houses back out of the floodplain so you can restore them into floodplain. I've worked in Johnson Creek too over the years. Oh, yeah. Okay. What are your thoughts on perhaps leveraging some of this um, livability, for want of a better description, um, into the existing natural resource protection that we have from Department of State lands, the Army Corps of Engineers, to protect those resources, um, create these livable communities, um, but also create this you know, accessibi accessibility to, to nature, not only for wildlife's value, but for you know, the, value of the value that nature, the inherent value in nature. Oh, I love that. Intrinsic value of nature, which we hear very rarely. Um, yeah. So well, yeah. first of all, your comment about wetlands. I, I don't know how recent the inventories are, but I know I read in the comp plan, I don't know if it was in this plan, that the wetland inventories were done in July. Well, shit. <laughs> You're in July. Right. We were out there today and saw this really cool, what's the stream? Really, Anderson Creek, very cool resource, a very uh, natural, nat not natural, but you can look at the extent of it and say that's a corridor. Um, could you have a trail through there? Well, in the upland portion, I think you probably could weave something in there, uh, not necessarily even beyond the oaks, but maybe near the oaks. Um, but my, the first question that came to my mind is, is that not wetland too? I don't know this time of year, that's really tough to call unless you get the soils and you start doing the soil analysis. But there are wetlands out there and that stream quarter is incredibly valuable. A lot of people would look at it and say, it's a piece of crap, why worry about it? It's not that, it's not that wide. Listen, riparian habitat of any size um, is critically important habitat for migratory species, for resident species, and of course for the neighborhood as well. Um, so, I don't know. I, first of all, my, one of the questions I pose today is, well, are you thinking about climate change? Like in Portland, um, there's, there's definitely, in, in the metropolitan region, the winter storms are going to become more intense. There's going to be more storm water to, to deal with during the winter months and drier during the summer. So that ha should be factored in, and we're trying to do that, Bureau of Environmental Services, Johnson Creek and elsewhere, um, creating cold water refugia um, along Crystal Springs Creek, for example. So, yeah, we need <laughs> all of those resources you described. There's a mosaic out there, and there's connectivity out there that if this plan doesn't address that, that will be a huge loss to Hood River, in my opinion. And it's not insignificant. You know, the, the oak forest, the mixed conifer oak forest, and the, and the, the uh, Pure oak forest and that stream corridor are incredibly important assets. Got one here. Somewhat related to the previous question. What percentage would you say of the 450 acres do you think is a goal that we should have? <laughs> or, or is there, you know, should we be having a goal? I got a, a member of my board, Tom Lipton, who started, founded the Eco Roof Program for the city of Portland, continually says, how much green is enough? <laughs> how much green is enough? I don't have a clue. I think, I think it needs to be looked at from the perspective of what is out there on the ground currently, what potential is there for restoring areas that are degraded, take a look at the, the overall um, 450 acres and you're gonna have to do that as a community. There isn't any um, uh, number. Although there are people, this is an interna international movement that says you need half. There literally is international movement that like, like half, half isn't enough. I can't remember the name of it, but like half for nature. But I don't think that's gonna cut it politically um, and practically. So I really think you need to be doing the inventory work. I don't know who, well, here's the deal. I read your report. I did see the word nature twice. 
I don't remember if I saw a habitat once. I may be wrong, but I'm telling you that that report, it's cool, a lot of great stuff. There was like page after page regarding the roundabout. Pages about this roundabout, which obviously is important for dealing with your, your congestion, no question about it. But in terms of habitat, there was very little in that, in that report. So from, as an outside observer and somebody, if I were here, I'd be going, wait a minute, where's the habitat here? And actually the other big missing piece, which was explicitly acknowledged, was we don't have a stormwater, a comprehensive stormwater plan, right? It's gonna happen after this plan is adopted. I would, I would argue that, that they should go hand in hand and that that stormwater management program should be integrated with the, the, the natural area and the parks plans. 